Hi, everybody, and welcome to this week's episode of Rock Your Shine After You Have Been Cracked Wide Open. I am so excited to introduce my guest this week, Lauren Bosler. And I'm going to just read a quick bio about Lauren and introduce her to all of you. Lauren is a Boston-based registered drama therapist who uses the arts to facilitate healing and connection with numerous populations. Currently, she is the director of the Veronica B. Smith Senior Center in Brighton, Mass., where she utilizes the arts to work with older adults and promotes new and creative programming with this often overlooked population. She also helps run the Peace by Peace Trauma Ministry at Fourth Presbyterian Church in South Boston, her home church, which utilizes both the arts and community to facilitate healing and processing of trauma. Previous roles include working at an assisted living facility and many years of waitressing. Lauren has been in recovery for many years and continues to credit the principles of recovery to her growth. In her free time, she takes singing lessons and spends time with her family and friends. Welcome. Thank you so much, Susan. Thank you for having me. This is lovely. (laughs) Well, I'm so excited. And just for my listeners, we, Lauren and I did not have a lot of time to talk prior to. So I'm going to be learning about her story at the same time as you are. So Lauren, let's start. What I know about you, obviously, is the work that you're doing now and that you have been in recovery. Let's talk about where your work and what you're doing speaks to this idea of what it means to really getting to know who you are after you've been cracked wide open? Because I have a feeling there's a big story there. Yeah. I mean, I think for me, I was sort of cracked wide open, as you, as you say, which I think is such a beautiful way to put it. In my 20s, you know, when I was young, I was a theater major back in the day. My undergrad was musical theater. And sort of after graduation, I found myself sort of adrift, not really knowing how to use these gifts that I'd been given, not really knowing where to go, what to do. And I found myself just sort of, yeah, I found myself going down this rabbit hole, you might say, of the hospitality industry. The the restaurant industry can be very, you know, So I I found myself just losing myself, you know, not really using, not singing, not acting, not doing any of those things that sort of brought me joy. I was losing my joy, I like I I sometimes say, you know. And, you know, that kind of continued throughout my twenties. It got worse and worse. And you know, when I was twenty seven, I sort of I sort of had a a realization that, you know, drinking was not gonna work for me. I could not do it the way that other people seem to be able to do it. And, you know, I, I, I started going to an outpatient rehab and it's the best thing I could have done for myself. Well, I was, I was, I was inpatient for a while and then I went to eight months of outpatient treatment and it's absolutely. Let's slow, let's the, slow down. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's slow down just a little bit. So how did you realize what was happening? Did you have, you know, did you wake up from a blackout? Were your friends concerned about you? Did you have an intervention? Like what kind yeah. of led you? I mean, I think that we can all recognize, you know, sort of that snowball effect, right? Where mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, where your drinking was getting out of control. But what was your awakening for you to say, I really have to do something here? Yeah, I, I don't know. I didn't have, like, I talked to some people in recovery that have you know, this moment of sort of, that's it, you know, I give up, you know, I didn't really have that moment of surrender. It sort of seems like just a slow slide into the bottom for me, you know, and everyone's bottom is going to be totally different. You know what I mean? But for me, it was, for me, it was just knowing, you know, I ended up in the hospital. I mean, for me, that was scary enough to say, this is, this is not, working, you know, and I had friends that were concerned. My family was concerned. Okay. So, so you I didn't ended, s- did you end up in the hospital from an event or did you? Yeah. Yourself? Yeah. I would, I would say okay. so. I would say so. Okay. But, you know, I think, you know, it was, it was a cul- culmination of things, you know, it was a culmination of things. And, and for me, I was, I was really sort of riding the line there for a while of this is really fun and, and I'm young and I'm, 
you know, this it, it's so glamorous. And then and I, but I was sort of riding this line of but I'm a mess and I'm and I'm and I'm sad and I'm upset and I'm and, the you know, and, it, you know, it was hard because in your 20s, it seems like everyone's sort of doing the same thing you're doing. For me, it just felt different. It felt like I couldn't get my act together. And I was just sliding into this place that was sapping all of my potential, all of my energy, all of my joy, all of my anything that used to excite me was gone. So for me, it was sort of I reached this point where I just knew that I had to start doing something differently. You know, it, it, it that was about it. <laughs> So talk to us, you know, and, and and it's funny because, you know, my close friends know that two years ago, I don't know if you've ever heard of a woman called Annie Grace, but she's really doing a lot of beautiful things for people and helping them to get sober and whatnot. And I just, you know, my friends and I decided that we were going to go on a cleanse and really look at our relationship mm. with alcohol. Like, why do you drink? What does it give you? You know, because I mean, you think that two or three glasses a night aren't a big deal, whatever, but the, but what was so enlightening for me, because I also haven't had a drink in two and a half years. And it was just this moment of, I wasn't sure why I was drinking every day, you know? I mean? Yeah. And so it's just, it's, so these are some of my favorite conversations, because I think that as we think about living our life intentionally, it's also, you know, what we're consuming and why and what is right. it actually doing for us, you know? So mm -hmm. anyways, I just wanted to interject that. So please. No, I, I think that that's totally, you know, there's this saying in, in, in AA, it's like, you know, I gave up everything for one thing, you know, and then I gave up one thing and I got everything. And that's really how I feel about, I'm about just, my drinking. Oh my God, yeah. Just, yeah. Yeah. Because that drink at night would just be enough. So I didn't feel like jumping on my bike, you know, or I didn't feel like going for that walk or, so I really appreciate this. So you decided you went into the hospital, you got out, you went on this eight month journey, right? Where you were in recovery. And when you say eight months, was that, what, what did that recovery look like? Was that AA? Yeah. Did so this way? I didn't go away. I was I was living in Philadelphia at the time. And believe it or not, I was still in the restaurant industry. I was still waiting tables. I was still around alcohol quite a bit. But that's, a, <laughs> I can get into that in a minute. But it was an intensive outpatient treatment. So it was four days a week uh, during the day. If I remember correctly, two two of the days were sort of long days where we took classes and things like that. And then I had individual therapy, which I up to that point never had therapy. And then Friday, like everyone came together for like a community, you know, meeting. And this place was really interesting. It was, it was called Chances. It was in, yeah, it, it, I was very much in the minority at this place. So it was mostly, I would say mostly African-American women and mostly like hard drug users, but it was the best place I have ever been in my life. I credit this place with basically saving my life. You know, it was a mixed bag, mixed bag. And some of the women I'm still friendly with, you know, and I, I never really felt out of place. I never felt like, oh, I shouldn't, they, they, we were all in this together. And I still think that that was one of the most beautiful, you know, experiences of my life. When I graduated from there, I, I remember my dad saying to me, I'm, this is the most proud I've ever been at a graduation for you. You know what I mean? Because that graduation actually meant something. <laughs> not that, not that educational graduations don't mean anything, but this one really meant I'm trying to change my life here. Like this yeah. graduation yeah. means more. This is a so much evolution, state. right? I mean, yes. This is really yes. Doing the hard, hard work. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So it was, Really, I'm just still so very proud of that. I think I graduated in 2000 and I would say 12. I've lost, time is crazy. I've lost track. It might've been 2011 or 12, but it was a beautiful experience to to be in amongst those women. It was all women too, which was what I needed at the time because my relationships were also messy. <laughs> I was going to say your relationships probably weren't tip top either. <laughs> Not at all. And I think, you know, it was, I don't, I can't blame the person. It, it was both of us, you know, it was, it was volatile. It was, it was being in your twenties and having anger issues and drinking issues and all these issues when you're young that you don't know how to deal with, you know, that, that eventually leads to sort of an implosion 
and that's kind of what hap happened to happen to me. Yeah. And not only when we're young, right? I mean, I think yeah. our, I think our awakening, you know, happens at different times. Sometimes I, I, you know, when I was working with the elderly, I remember working with a 75 year old woman who was struggling very much with alcoholism and finally quit. It was like the most <laughs> beautiful thing. Like there's never a second chance. Right. It never runs out for us until we take our last breath, right? Then we transition to the oh. other side. But oh, that is never... that gave me chills now. Yeah, <laughs> but I do, I do late. believe that's true as well. Absolutely. It's never too late. I feel very blessed that there was something in me. There was something in me that got this, that real had this realization when I was young. I've, but it is never too late. Yeah. So talk to us then. Like, so you had, you graduated, you were still <laughs> working in the restaurant industry. Yeah. And so yeah. something pulled you into the arts. So do, did you always sing? Is that something that you always Oh, sing? yes. I've been a singer for, I don't know, I guess ever since I was a little kid. But I really started taking like formal voice lessons when I was in middle school. And I love singing. My grandmother on my father's side was an actress and a singer and all that. So I think, I don't know, sometimes they say it skips a generation. I'm not <laughs> sure. But I've always loved theater. I've always loved performing. So so what was, uh, yeah. So, 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 so what you, you kind of said that you would let yes. go of your love right. of singing and everything. And then, but now you graduated from this yes. eight month program. What happens next? Yeah. So when I was in this eight month program, right, there was a intern from Drexel university and she was a dance therapist. And I thought, wow, that's really, that's really neat. You know, <laughs> I had heard of music therapy. It always sort of peaked something in my brain. To say, oh, that, you know, that sounds interesting. Yeah. But so this dance therapist and I would meet for these one-on-one -on -one sessions in addition to everything else I was doing at the, at the place, you know, I sort of wanted to pick her brain and say, well, how did you, you know, I'm starting to get interested in things again. Like what, what is your journey? You know? So I would meet with her and we do these one-on-one -on -one sessions. And that's kind of when I started to realize that like the body, the brain connected you know, being able to sort of move through some of what I was going through, move through the sort of, I would say, trauma that I had been through was just so amazing. So she said, and I remember her saying to me, okay, so if you like dance therapy, you know that there is also drama therapy. And I was like, what? I had never heard of drama therapy ever, ever. And I went, I think I went home that very day and sort of and sure enough, there uh, there's a handful of programs across the country for drama therapy. And I was like, this is it. This is it. This is the combination of my love of theater and sort of my desire now to sort of start to help people to use the arts in a different way, to use the arts for healing, for growth, you know. So that started my journey to apply for grad schools. My first year, I didn't get into any. I stayed out. I stayed in Philadelphia, still waiting tables, still getting my, you know, getting stronger. So just yep. wait as you're getting stronger. This is important yep. because I have this feeling we share this belief. I haven't asked you this, that, you know, the universe really has our back, you know, and when, and when a door closes, it's for a reason and divine timing and all of that. I don't know what your beliefs were then, but the first hit I got when you got that rejection that you didn't get in anywhere, did you have a backslide of like, you know, what was going on for you mentally? Were you strong thinking, okay, this is happening for a reason? Like, what was your reaction? Because I could almost feel like that would be, yeah. you know, you're all excited to go do this thing. And then the doors right. aren't opening. What was happening right. for you when, when you were getting those rejections? Well, that's funny because it was one rejection. I think I put my eggs in one basket, oh, okay. you know, <laughs> and so my first year was like, I have, I want to go to New York city. I've always wanted to be in New York city. This is where I'm meant to be. You know, this is my moment to, to go to this program in New York city. And I didn't get in and I was sort of devastated by that, but I didn't backslide or anything like that. I, you know, I worked through it. And then the next year when I applied, I applied to more programs, <laughs> you know, including one here in Boston at Leslie university. And I think that first year I sort of sold myself short. I thought, this is where I want to go. This is it, blah, blah, blah. The next year I took the time to go to Boston, to go to San Francisco, to go to New York, to kind of really poke around and, and see, do I see myself here? Do I see myself there? You know, and it was Boston. 
where I felt this connection. And I, that was the, that was the school that I, I wasn't even really going to consider. And when I came to the city and I sort of, you know, I, I stayed here for a bit, I rode the mass transit around I, and I, I can actually see myself living in this city. And I knew no one in Boston. I knew no one in at all. So I was really just sort of packing my stuff up, leaving Philadelphia and moving to Boston on my own. And it was Boston that, that stuck. So I feel like, yeah, that extra year gave me a little bit more time, sober time under my belt, first of all, growth, continuing, you know, getting, you know, and, and also it just gave me a little bit more perspective on, you know, what, 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 yeah, you wanted to go to New York when you were young, but what about now? Like, figure out what you want for your life now, you know, and, and that's what led me to Boston. And this is beautiful, I think, in a worthy pause, because this is the intentionality I'm talking about. You know, when I, 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 this just happened, my, he's basically a godchild, and he just graduated from college in four years ago when he got rejected from this college, and he was devastated. It's very difficult to tell a young person, it is, it is for your greater good, even though you can't accept that. But I, but, you know, what I, what I talked to him about is what, makes your heart sing and what lights you up what gets you excited because what you're talking about when we take the moment to think about not from desperation right Mm -hmm. but from what brings me joy and that's all of our senses who's around me what's my environment look like what kind of people do i want to be around you know that's when we really start to create this future of what it is that we're being pulled to in a very intentional way. So I love that story when you paused to really think about what do I really want? Right, right. Yeah. And, and so I did think you get into Leslie College? Is that what I did? Talking? Yeah, I got into Leslie University. And I think, you know, that was one of the biggest accomplishments of my life, even thus far. I mean, doing it all on my own. I really did do it all on my own. I found the school. I applied. I would take the bus back and forth between Philly and Boston to find an apartment, to register for classes, you know, and, and, and I drove here by myself. I, I, you know, I hired a moving company. They met me a few days later at my new apartment. You know, I really did do it all on my own. And I knew no one when I moved here and I was so lonely for the first, you know, little bit of time here. I remember, you know, having days where it was like all the only person I talked to was the checkout lady at at Star Market, you know, I mean, I was lonely. Did I make the right decision? But I sort of kept going, kept going. And, and what you said really connected with me. Moving here was a chance to start a new community, to surround myself with people that had my best interests at heart to sort of grow and be in this city that never knew me as a, as a drunk person, (laughs) you know, never, never knew me as sort of the mess that I was in my twenties, a fresh start. I really did have a fresh start and I like to say I took advantage of it. I'm very happy, but. And here you are, how many years later and you're still living Uh, in Boston? (laughs) It'll be, it'll be 11 years in July that I've lived in Boston, which is crazy, crazy, crazy. absolutely crazy. Boston is such a great city though. It's kind of a nice, you know, you know that I live here in Maine in Portland. It's a nice in between, between like a Portland and a New York, you know, like Boston is just a a great city. Hi, everyone. I wanted to take a moment to announce some exciting news that I am finally releasing my six-week grief and loss virtual course and lots more information in the show notes about the course. It's a PDF that you can pull up and read all about the details, what we're going to be covering the focus and the structure of the course. You can sign up on my website, rockyourshine.com. You'll find Leap into Light and Healing under the service menu. 
The course will begin on Wednesday, June 7th, and that'll be held from 6 to 7 Eastern time. So if you or anyone you know is ready to take the next step in their healing and really have a place to share and process, then please send them over to rockyourshine.com. I look forward to working with you guys. Take care and enjoy the rest of the show. So tell us what you do. Tell us, I love in reading your bio, did you end up working with the elder population? Oh gosh. So, you know, I've always loved older adults, you know, Um, even as a kid, I liked singing songs from their era, which has changed as I've gotten older, you know, older adults are not from the twenties anymore, (laughs) you know, or the thirties or, you know, but I, I never thought that that would be my career. And I went to, you know, grad school and really thought I'd gravitate towards working with addiction and recovery, sort of the background I had been, you know, coming from. But I did a, an internship on a geriatric psychiatry unit of a hospital. And that experience, that was it. I was like, these are my people. These are my people. I love them. You know, well, what were you doing with them? Like, I really want to know. Yeah. I wouldn't think like I just naturally would not think that is where a therapeutic theater major would go. Like it, it's right. sort of like, OK, make that bridge for us. Well, it wasn't where a lot of my classmates went. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I think still the working with older adults is not where people gravitate. But, you know, I was working sort of, you know, acute mental health a mix a jerry psych unit is a very mixed bag sometimes so you're seeing you're seeing alzheimer's and other forms of dementia but also schizophrenia bipolar major depression you know you're seeing it all and they're all together you know for better or for worse they're kind of all lumped together so i was running like morning groups where we would do check-ins and i was doing individual expressive therapy with people trying to get to know people i remember one patient loved musicals, loved Broadway musicals. So we sort of connected over listening to, you know, musicals. So there was another patient who just liked to come into the room and get a piece of paper and stencils and crayons and do these stenciling, you know, art pieces of art, you know? So it was interesting to see like sort of where, what, what medium people gravitated towards. It wasn't always drama, you know, which is fine with me, the arts, I'll do it all. I'll sing, I'll, <laughs> I'll dance with you. I'll, I'll draw with you. I'll do whatever, you know? So for me, that was the experience where, you know, obviously they were the most acutely sort of ill, but after that experience, I worked there part-time for a bit. And then I moved on to working in an assisted living facility. So not quite as acute as the patients I was seeing in the hospital, but still dementia, Alzheimer's, and now I'm the director of a senior center. So these folks are much more independent, young, old, as they say, as opposed to old, old, but all, all sort of informing each other. I mean, the way that I look at my job at the senior center now, there's still people that come in sometimes that are dealing with, you know, mental health issues. So my background, I'm able to sort of meet these people where they're at and not feel overwhelmed or, or you know, frightened by them. I'm able to sort of use my background to infuse my current position. It makes me very emotional because as I shared with you, my mom, the elderly are very near and dear to my heart. You know, my mother, after her stroke, she, you know, would fall and Mm. she was aphasic. And what that means for listeners is she could not talk. And so, you know, when she would go into rehabs, you know, or, you know, she had to go into an assisted living for a couple of weeks that as she was rehabilitating and, you know, it was very difficult because she could not speak. So I was there constantly and really watching and not all facilities are that great and Mm. taking care of our elders. And, and so this story is so beautiful. My mother was an artist, you know, she, even after her stroke, she used to love to do, you know, we would take it down to the pottery place that they had and she would because she was huge into ceramics at one point in her life and it's so therapeutic Mm -hmm. and so I'm just curious as the director of this organization how do you infuse the arts in this assisted living facility what what does that look like I'm sure you're probably not doing that as the director but you may do have actually I am which is really yeah I really am so I, I 
you know, at my current job, I run a theater group for older adults. Yeah. So I do, t- I, I, I know I'm the director, but my real passion is running programming and being with people. So my door, my office door never closed, never closed. You know, I'm just, I, that is what makes my job. That's what, that's what I love about my job is I'm, o- I'm always around people. There's never a dull moment. You know, so I still, we have an older adult theater group on Wednesdays and we've been, oh my gosh, they're amazing. You know, so every week we're doing sort of different principles. I would say I pull in from drama therapy, but I also pull a lot from my actual theater background. You know, we're learning what stage right is, what stage left is, but we're also sort of playing with the ideas of of improv and joy and creativity. And we laugh a lot. And I think that that in itself is so therapeutic, seeing these older adults that sort of, I guess they never really thought they'd have another chance to do something like this or even ever have a chance. You know, there's some that have done theater and now they're doing it again and they're so excited. There's some that never have. And they're just like, I can't believe I'm doing this. This is, this is crazy. You know, so we have our theater group, but we also, I'm bringing in interns. We had a student from Emerson and she did a storytelling group, which culminated in a performance, like a reader's theater performance, which was amazing. It was absolutely amazing. We have, we have musicians, we have artists, we have, yeah, I mean, I'm just trying to, I'm trying to make it so well-rounded and so not the stereotypical thing that people think of when they think of, you know, there's so many people Think of assisted living or a senior center, which is what I'm at now, which is really a day program, as the TV's on, people are drinking coffee, they're playing bingo, there's not much going on, there's not much excitement. It's just a place for people to go to sort of, you know, I don't know, while away the time. And And until they die, that's how they feel. And that is what my passion, I feel like my passion in life has become debunking that stereotype that there's this point where that you reach where that's it, you know? And I, I just, I feel very passionately about that, you know, that these folks are so creative and so they would blow you away. And at our senior center, they're busier than you are, <laughs> you know, <laughs> from Monday through Friday from eight thirty to four, they are busier than the average. I'm coming person. to this. Thing. I am going to come yeah. there. I, yeah. I I love that because my mom. It was a running joke. So my dad was sick, and that's why my mother had to go someplace for two weeks. And and literally, she even after her stroke, my mother was just this Italian feisty woman. She was up for everything, and she was so bored at this place because. Every all the elder people, right? She's in her late seventies. They all went to bed, so she'd sit up and she'd help the staff fold clo- fold the laundry oh my God. and the towels and drink coffee. I mean, I love what you're saying. Is I literally yeah. feel like my heart is just exploding into fireworks because it's what I said earlier. It's never too late. And our elders, I they are my favorite population to hang. They have yeah. so much to teach us about life and about wasting time like so like talk about wasting time a lot of us waste time I mean just you listening to you your inspiration and enthusiasm and passion is lighting me up because when people are doing what they're passionate about you can't you can't it's like you bask in that warmth it's like we want everybody doing what they're passionate about because imagine the world if everyone was doing what lit them up and the people you're lighting up and what's spreading through that center with all of these elderly having this wonderful time at you know I call it you know sunset right where they're on sunset Yeah. yeah and and so what have you noticed about the population I mean do you see that infused throughout the center and the way how it's changed the atmosphere. I mean, I would just yeah. be curious. I, I mean, I think I do. And, you know, I, sh- I certainly don't want to sit here and toot my own horn, but I do hear comments about how... Toot away! The, the, <laughs> toot, 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 no. <laughs> but the, the center has changed a lot under under sort of my leadership and also my assistant director. We work so well together, you know? So when you have a, 
when you have a, a coworker, when you have a co-director that you work well together, that changes everything too, because you're both sort of on the same page. And, but I think we've changed it. I think it's really, the, the word has kind of gotten out in the neighborhood that it's kind of a, a, a the place to be, you know, there's buzz around it. And now you've and, got a long wait list, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's funny because, you know, there's still, there will always be folks who say, I'm not going to go there because I'm not old. There, there, I will, you know, there will always be people who don't want to go to the senior center because that means admitting that they are old, you know, so that's okay. You, you know, but I'm hoping, I'm hoping maybe some of those folks will see that it, it, it's just, we're still doing fun stuff here. It doesn't mean that you're giving up by coming to a senior center. You know, it's like almost the word senior center sometimes I think needs to be rebranded to like center for active aging or a place for, you know, like it just, the word senior sometimes or elderly really gets people, you know, these are, these are words I don't love. You know, they, the, the city of Boston, which, which is what I work for, they rebranded. They're not the elderly commission anymore. They're the age strong commission, which I think language matters. It matters. It matters. Elderly commission makes you think, you know, age strong commission makes it, it just totally different. It's totally different. And, you know, we always talk about that age is a mindset. Yeah. And it is. I mean, I think that, you know, there's so much science behind what keeps us young and it is keeping our mind active and keeping our bodies active. Those two things, you know, my dad, he's 83 years old. He walks four miles a day and he's worn his walker heels. I mean, the walker wheels down. He's yeah. happy, you know, <laughs> And it just makes me smile because, you know, I have lots of elderly people around me who just think they, they walk constantly and I look at them and say that that's yeah. the person I want to be when I grow up, you know, and I think it is, I think it's language, it's state of mind. And it's also what you're providing is you also need when you're in these elder centers or you're in an assisted living, you have to have the people that believe that too. Yeah. That's a huge part of it. And you know, who are the staff? How do they see the people that they're working with? This is very true for mental health as well, mm -hmm. as you are mm -hmm. aware. Um, yep. And I think that, that that's equally, if not more important. And so if you're walking in there and you're seeing through this lens, these amazing people that have lived this incredible life and it's far from over, right? Far I mean, from over, we yeah. We can have a blast until the very end, if health-wise, if we're able what happens with, so you've got, this is a senior center. So this must be a mix also, right? Of people that have Alzheimer's. Did you say, do you like what's. Well, for this job, I don't see as much Alzheimer's or other forms of dementia as I did in my previous role. Cause they don't live at the senior center. It's just Monday through Friday, eight thirty to four. It's a day program. You know what I mean? So you, but again, the background that I have sort of informs what I see. And you will see sometimes co like cognitive changes with people or, you know, just things to sort of be, so have on your radar a bit, you know, that person seems to be declining a little bit, you know, or this or that, but it's much different than assisted living, which is, you know, yeah. for me, it's like, it's very important also to not sort of lump this whole, this, this whole basket of older adults, into one basket. Right. There's young, old, there's newly retired, 65, 70, still driving, very independent, very active, you know, then there's sort of, you know, old, and then there, there could be old, old, you know, old you know, people that I was working with at my previous job, you know, in their nineties, up into a hundred, you know? So, and each, each generation is going to be totally different, you know, and each person is totally different. So, you know, the music that you play for the generation that's old, old, not going to be the music that's going to hit for people that are young old, you know? So it's stuff like that. Thinking about that, you know, and they don't want to. Yeah. Young old folks are not the world war two generation, but you know, they're the Vietnam generation now, you know? So it's, it's very, you have to think about who you're interacting with as well. And not just sort of saying, Oh, this is an old person. Absolutely. And the, well, the other question I wanted to talk to you about, and I know that there's been a lot of, information that's come out certainly since COVID because mental health issues, of course, skyrocketed mm. during that time. And I think we're just seeing still the tip of the iceberg of some of the 
the after effects of that because our elder population are also can be quite lonely, you know, and, and especially like my dad who lost, you know, my mom. So there's a lot of elders out there too, that are living alone. You know, they've got grown children that might live around the country. They don't get to see very often, et cetera. And then when COVID happened, you know, here we're trying to protect our elders and at the same time, creating more of this isolation and loneliness. I'm, I'm interested because of your mental health background, as well, as well as your theater background, because they've had a ton of loss in their lives, right? The older they are, the more loss that they've had. So I'm just interested in the work that you're doing at the senior center. Of course, all of the activities that they are involved in, there is a mental health component to that. But is there any kind of, I guess I just want to say, there a therapeutic component to some of those residents who may you know, be struggling with depression and things like that. Is that a piece that you guys? Yeah. I mean, I think that we, that I can sometimes see that it's, I think for me, it's all about the lens that I've been given. (laughs) So I am there to support people wherever they're at, you know, and I can help refer them to different things. The thing, the problem sometimes with older adults is, and not all of them, of course, but they mental health for them is, why would you want to spend time on my mental health? I'm, it doesn't matter. You know, they come from, some of them come from a generation where it was, you didn't talk about anything. You didn't talk about your problems because that meant you were airing your dirty laundry, you know? So they play their cards close to their vest sometimes. So it's tricky sometimes mental health with older adults. You kind of, for me, what I have found is you kind of have to frame it differently. You can't say, okay, it's time for therapy. What? No, I, you know, you, you have to kind of infuse it into what you're doing. Have conversations with people. You don't necessarily have to say, this is your hour of therapy. Let's get a cup of coffee. Let's chat. Like, tell me what's going on. You know what I mean? Like, I see that you, you've been looking a little down lately. Do you want to talk about that or anything? You know, but it is, I think, again, coming back to language, a lot of, a lot of the folks that I've learned from, they don't necessarily like to talk about their problems, (laughs) you know, and it's, it's, it's like a generation of, it's a pride thing. It's pride. Yeah, yeah. And and it was it's like there's I've heard so many stories about people who were didn't know that they had a, a sibling that was sort of shuttled to a different place, or they didn't know that their who they thought was their mother was actually their sister. No, other way around. The thought was their sister was actually their mother. I've heard that story sometimes. I've heard of people, you know, sort of, it just, there were things that happened to them that they didn't even realize till years later, Yeah. you know, because of this gener- this sort of wall of silence, I think that that's been put up in our society. It's only, I think, until very sort of recently that people have really started talking about mental health and you know it just was not part of their world i i agree 100% and i remember you know with brain injury depression is can often be an outgrowth of that or you know a lasting symptom of a brain injury and stroke of course is a brain injury and my mother she was very depressed and mm. And yet she would have these wonderful moments, but she was also aware enough to know all she had lost in the stroke. And, you know, one of the things that brought her the greatest joy was talking, you know, like I said, she was that sort of quintessential Italian mom and she refused to take any medication or, you know, and of course she couldn't go into talk therapy for, for obvious reasons. But, you know, I think that what is interesting about our culture too, is that with multiple losses and sort of this loneliness and depression that is can be a consequence of that, that we also, and I, this is what I think you're getting at, we don't need to pathologize it. I think that it's, again, that intentionality of spending time 
with our mm-hmm. elder parents. You know, we are, you know, we are very busy. And I'm, I'm saying this to my listeners out there and the young people that might be listening that you have parents, but as your parents start to age, I think making sure we spend that time calling them. Sometimes it's mm. just, I talk to my dad every day. I used to talk to my mom every day that, that I also think can help with that feeling of being forgotten about, right. Or feeling useless or waiting to die or mm-hmm. some of the other things that I have heard from the older population. And I, so I love all of the things that you're talking about right now, because it's so important that we make that time, even if it's a neighbor, you know, to go sit and chat and have coffee for 20 minutes. Right. It doesn't have to be your family either, which I think is, you know, it's, it, families are complicated and, (laughs) you know, (laughs) things happen and, 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 you know, so, but, you know, maybe just finding some sort of, like you said, a neighbor or a person or, 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 or an avenue or a way to connect with folks who might be a little bit more lonely or shut in, I think is really important. Like, you know, my, my dad delivers meals on wheels. I was just going to say yeah, that. Yeah. You know, and, and, and he, I mean, my, let's be honest, my, I can't believe it, but my parents are both, you know, late seventies at this point, you know, but my dad is, is delivering meals on wheels and, you know, that, that, I just think that's so great to be able to be the person that, you know, yes connects with someone, even if it's just delivering them a meal or something. I, I find stuff like that very, that just very often overlooked. So important. So important. Yeah. Well, and I, and I love that too, because that's also like when the elder, you know, my, we had this volunteer program here and these two young people, these two young moms, they were in their early, late thirties, I think. And you know, and what they did for my mother and my father, and who are still so supportive to my dad. And, you know, so even that, if, you know, I'm always telling people, if you're looking for volunteer opportunities, yeah. they're out there, they are know? out there. And they would come and spend an hour or two with my mom a week. And it made all the difference. But mm-hmm. also the older people doing like she also had elders who were volunteers for her too, which gave them that continued feeling right. of purpose and giving. Right. I can't even believe we've been talking for an hour. That's I, crazy because we didn't even get to, to piece by piece yet. I know, but <laughs> we're getting there because you and I talked for a few minutes <laughs> before this. So yes, let's, jump, let's jump into piece by piece. So thank you for that segue. Talk to us about that program. Sure. So yeah, I feel like, again, sort of the culmination of all these paths in my life and at the core of it all, I think is my recovery. But you know, one thing that happened to me when I moved to Boston was I found a church community, which trust me, was not part of the plan. That was not part of the plan. I'll try to make this story very short, but at my, my, basically my realtor who helped my, find me my apartment of all people, my realtor ended up being this really just incredible light in my life when I first moved here. And she got me connected to a job, which was still waiting tables, by the way, but I, you know, paid the bills and, and the recovery community, because she was also in recovery and she invited me to her church and it was fourth Presbyterian church in South Boston. It was, she was the kind of person that just, she, she always wanted to make sure I was okay, that I wasn't lonely, that I was all right. You know, cause she knew I was all by myself. She'd come over. Sometimes we'd go for walks. She'd take me out to Castle Island to get a hot dog or whatever. So she brought me to church one Sunday and it, it's funny because I, I still tell this story. I was like, it wasn't for me. It wasn't for me. So thanks, but no thanks, Betsy, you know, but then in the spring, she said, well, we're having a 12 step, like a recovery group. So why don't you just come for that and see, you know, how you feel? So I did. And actually I really enjoyed the recovery group. Well, if you enjoyed that, after the recovery group, there's choir right after. And I know you love to sing, you know? So slowly I started to get back involved with this community. Okay. Now I'm singing in the choir. I'm coming to church on Sundays. And it just sort of organically just became part of my life here in Boston. Still, I will say to my pastor, I'm not exactly sure how religious I am, but I, I am so glad that there's this space for me to sort of wrestle with that in community with people that are, it just is an amazing space. So part of what we have started, and this was before the pandemic, is a trauma healing ministry. 
So of course that to me, that was really interesting because you don't necessarily see churches combining what they do with mental health, right? So these two worlds coming together and is not, is not something you see at every church. So we based our, what we do on Roxbury Presbyterian church, their model, they, they call it, can we talk, but they came, they sort of taught us what they do at their church. And through the years we've gone to, you know, trauma retreats together and classes together and, you know, just learning what, what trauma is and how, how it affects people in our congregation, how it affects the whole community. So we started this program that we call Peace by Peace. It meets on Monday evenings and it's a place for folks to come and what we say in our guidelines is share their experiences of grief, loss, or trauma, as well as their healing process. And, and we just started an arts component to it. So that's been real. So now like everything is coming full circle. <laughs> it's, how do you have time for all of these things? <laughs> uh, that's a good question. That's a good question. But it's, it's, it's what's so. The age group, what's the age group in piece by piece? Because it just sounds I would like. I say, you know, a... 18 and above. It's, it doesn't. Yeah, it's, yeah, I would say 18 plus. But the arts night is on the first Monday of the month. So we've been using, we usually start with a prompt of some kind or a poem. And then folks can go off and sort of create for half an hour. And then we come back and you can talk about or not talk about what you created. We have collaging and clay and journaling and watercolor. And I think that's it. And so wherever you're called to create that night, you know, and then the third Monday of the month is more of a talk based gathering with music. And we say it's in a church, but it's not a church service. It's a place to kind of just come together and to abide and to listen to each other. So where do you get, where else do you get that peaceful, quiet hour in your life? You know, so hard to carve that out these days. So that's what we aim to provide. That's, that is so beautiful. And also the spelling of piece by piece. Can you talk yeah. to us about the meaning of? Yeah, I think that, you know, I think in general, it's, it, it's sort of, we all come to this with different pieces of our lives, right? So P-I-E-C-E, -E, <laughs> you know, and what we're trying to find is P-E-A-C-E. -E. <laughs> so what we have at the front of the sanctuary is sort of this, this, and my, what my former colleague, Katie, created this. It's all broken dishes, broken pottery, sort of placed back together on this beautiful mural. So really we're saying we're all broken in some way. You know, we're all broken in some way. And what we're trying to do by coming together is helping ourselves heal. Well, you know, you I, I love that. I used to, for many years, I ran grief and loss at the Center for Green Children in South Portland. And my co-facilitator and I ran a tweens group. Oh my God, they were <laughs> so cute. Anyway, and kids, yeah. you know, they don't grieve in any kind of linear way. And what we would do yeah. is art. And yeah. so what we would, they, we, we would have one of the projects we would do is they had one of those little terracotta pods and yeah. we would have them break it, you know, we would in a bag and they would break it, not smash it into smithereens, right. but bigger pieces and the same concept. They would put, they would paint the pieces. They would do whatever they wanted with these beautiful little pieces. They could write on it. They could put glitter on it and they would put it back together and you know, there were holes, that beautiful saying, we all have cracks, that, how, that's how yes. the light gets in. Yes. And, and the same sort of concept where, you know, after a deep loss, it feels like your life is just shattered and there are these just pieces laying on the ground and that you can put it back together and like this beautiful mosaic design that it's not going to be the same, but it's going to be different. And those little holes where those light, where the light gets in is just a very yeah. profound symbolism for these children who have just, most of them who have lost a parent to cancer or yeah. something. So it's, I'm, I'm, I'm explaining the activity to listeners in case, you know, you can do this with your children. You yeah. can, it's just a really beautiful symbolic activity. That's also a lot of fun. Yeah. And I believe one of your former, I know you interviewed John Hazilla a few weeks yes, ago. Yes, I did. And he, he was the one who sort of introduced me to this concept. It's a Japanese where you break a teacup and then, and then fix it with gold lacquer. It's so beautiful. Yeah. You know, and, and I was like, oh my God, that's amazing. You know, but it's, this, it's, it's just, 
I think what we're trying to do is acknowledge that everyone is coming to the church with different hurts, different experiences, different backgrounds, you know, but we've all experienced some kind of, if you want to call it trauma or, you know, whatever, however you want to process that, you know, so to have a space and some people have trauma from the church, you know, yes. from church thank, experiences. Thank you for saying that. That's very, that, yeah. yes, yes. You know, so it's, and I totally get that, <laughs> you know, I, I thought church was never something I would go back to. Not that I had a, a terrible experience growing up, but it just wasn't on my radar. So to be involved with this and to be involved with what I do for a living, to be involved with recovery, it just seems to all kind of be making sense right now for me. These multiple paths that have happened to me in my life have kind of, I don't know, almost led me to this point. And I'm not certainly not sitting here saying like, my life is amazing and perfect. And oh my God, because I work on it. You know, it's a, it's a work in progress. We are Everything all is, a work in yeah, progress. We are all a work in progress. And, and I we, struggle sometimes, you know, but one thing I like to think about is, you know, this life that I'm living right now, if I had gone back, if I go back to, you know, 15, whatever, 16 years ago was something I was only dreaming about. You know, I, I mean, I was dreaming that I would have this kind of life where I was healthy and happy, it, it, you know, for the most part, content, success, you know, successful in something that I enjoy. I mean, that was something that just seemed not possible. So it's not like my life is this grand, glamorous, amazing, perfect thing. But if you compare yourself, compare yourself to yourself, instead of comparing yourself to what society expects from you, then I've, you know, I've come a long way. And I think people need to do that. Compare yourself to yourself instead of maybe expectations that are put upon us. That is so beautiful. I, I almost want to just like snap off the screen and say, bye, everybody. Like that, <laughs> that, that is, you know, because there's a beautiful saying out there, compare leads to despair, right? When we start comparing ourselves to all yeah, the people around totally. us. totally. And it's so easy to do that it's, in our society now. It's so, so easy. easy. And to miss the beauty that each of us bring to this world, right? I mean, yeah. I, I say it like we are all an original work of art. Like, why can't that ever just be enough? There is mm -hmm. no two people alike. And that is a beautiful mm -hmm. thing. And each moment we are creating our life right now in this, in, in each moment that we have, we have this choice, every single moment that unfolds of how we choose to feel, how we choose to see the world and the possibilities yeah. that are just everywhere around <laughs> us. So I love yeah. taking that moment to say, to look at that. So I'm going to swear for a minute, that badass self and what brought us <laughs> to where we are right now. Yeah, it are It is all of those cracks in our yeah. life, in our world that has brought us to right here. Yeah. I think it's also the people, you know, oh, it's God, also the yes. people. I think about these people that I don't even, you know, the dance therapist that I mentioned, I don't even really remember her name, but she impacted me so much that I'm talking about her all these years later. It's the people in your life. It's Betsy who helped me, who has since passed away actually, you know, but it's the people and it's, it's the, it's, it's the, yeah, I don't know. It's so it's, it, it just, it gives me goosebumps to me think too. about, but it's, <laughs> you know, it's the people and it's the paths and it's the, the, I don't know, the lessons you learn along the way. It's being Whether awake, it's being awake yeah. and paying attention because angels drop into our life every yes. day, our little breadcrumbs and they That's take it. our hand and they lead us to the next place. We do not, I don't know if anyone's ever familiar with Annie Lamont's book, Bird by Bird. It's one of my favorite books oh, as a writer. Yes. And you, we don't have to see, we don't have to see a mile ahead. We literally right. just have to follow the little breadcrumbs. Bird by bird. Us, bird by bird, right. And oh, thank you for this. This has been such oh, a beautiful interview. I, so I, end with, I do end with two questions, so you're sure. not off the hook yet. Now, you had <laughs> stated you don't really have social media. Is that right? If somebody wanted that to That is find correct. You. I have I have a personal Facebook, but I'm not like on Instagram or, I, or Twitter or anything like that, unfortunately. So I if anyone email. wanted to email you, yeah, if yes, to yeah, learn yeah. like more about your program, if you know, if we're hearing somebody who are in churches and are really yeah. excited about the idea of emulating these programs, we will have your email in the show notes. But would you like to share it with people? Sure. People yeah. So it's my my first name, Lauren A. Bosler at gmail.com. 
And that's so B-A-S-L-E-R. Be, yes, S-L-E-R, correct. So Lauren A. Bosler at gmail.com. I'd be happy. Yeah, I, the social media thing is funny because when I was filling out that form, I was like, oh, no, I... I really don't have much of this stuff, but John you, know, kind of <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think I might have an Instagram that maybe I use like once or something like that, but I just, I don't know. I kind of miss the boat on that stuff. I feel like sometimes when I, cause I work with older adults, I'm almost like, turn, like I kind of have the soul of one. I'm like, I don't know what any of that stuff is. <laughs> I know, trust. I have to, I've been having to get deep into it with the podcast. <laughs> right. Of I, course. I have a podcast production company that I've hired. Cause I, I like it. Yeah. They put little wheels up and do all the things that I don't have a clue <laughs> how to do. All right, right. So here are my last two questions for you. Okay. The first one is, What does self-love mean to you? Self-love to me means being okay with being alone, almost. It means being okay to sit with yourself and stop for a minute. Put the phone down. Put the emails down. Put the social media down. Put the, it means just being able to inhabit your body and and to be okay with it be okay with where you are in life you know I'm working on that I'm not there you know there are times where I'm like I don't like this part of my body and I don't like I don't like you know I struggle with self-image sometimes so it's about giving yourself grace and not not giving in to those voices that we hear in our head that tell us we're not good enough or not pretty enough or not thin enough or not this enough, especially with women. That's a whole nother story. We'll do another podcast. We're not young enough. (laughs) (laughs) So it means, it means being able to tune off to it for me, tune out those negative things that I think about every day and just saying, I'm okay. I'm okay. Beautiful. Okay. Finish the sentence. Hope is. I think hope is all around us. We have to look. Hope is all around us, but it requires sometimes work in our society to find it. (laughs) I think it can be very easy to slide into a place of, God, everything is, what is, you know, everything seems to be bad and wrong. And, and where do I even, where do I even fit in all this? I just feel like a tiny little speck in the midst of all of this pain and hurt and everything in, in our world. There is hope out there. There's hope. I think hope comes from connection. And so maybe it's like hope is connection. Beautiful. To self and others, right? Yeah. Lauren, I want to thank you for spending this time with us this morning. Thank Thank you for having me. This is, I think I said to you in the beginning, I'm like, I don't, I don't necessarily, this is something new to me. You know, I've never really been interviewed like this. And it was just really wonderful. Thank you. And thank you for all you do. It's just such important work. And I hope that that we can both continue to crack the world open with love. <laughs> yeah, me too. And compassion. Yeah. compassion. I want to thank all of my listeners for tuning in. Always, I trust that whoever is listening will take and walk away with something from today's conversation with Lauren. Thank you all for tuning in. I love you all. And we'll see you here next week. Bye for now.